You're listening to the voice of Russia in the heart of London. I'm Tim Warclay, and today I'm asking, are the London Olympics costing the taxpayer too much money? Last week, British members of Parliament raised concerns that the London 2012 Games could go over budget. The Public Accounts Committee released a report suggesting the Games and Legacy projects could cost around £11 billion. However, the government has rejected this figure. It says the Olympics is on time and on budget. Moreover, the cost has quadrupled. It was initially estimated that it would cost Britain around £2.4 billion in 2005. Now it's risen to £9.3 billion. And in recent months, concerns have been raised over the effect the Games will have on tourism in the UK over the summer, and if the Olympics will have a lasting legacy both nationally and locally. I'm joined in the studio by Tom Peck, who's the Olympics correspondent at the Independent newspaper, Tom Jenkins, who's executive director at the European Tour Operators Association, and John Goodbody, who's Olympics correspondent for the Sunday Times. Gentlemen, thank you for coming. So I'd first like to ask you all very simply, is the Olympics costing the taxpayer too much money? John. Um, in a word, no. Um, I, uh, the taxpayer, in fact, is putting in remarkably little money um, into that £9.3 billion, and a lot of the money of that £9.3 billion is money that is used for re regenerating an area that was extremely uh, derelict, uh, a lot of uh, 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 factories that were uh, old, and the whole area was, to be absolutely honest, uh, a disgrace to London. And fortunately, you know, the Olympics has given us the catalyst to be able to do something uh, for, for that. I believe that uh, the Games uh, will be a catalyst not only for that area, but also um, for British sport. Tom Jenkins? Um, I, the, the short answer is I don't know. Um, uh, the virtue of such um, oh. events really lie in themselves. Um, uh, you're having Olympic Games. The crucial point about the Olympic Games is it's a great party, a huge sporting festival, and it is to be judged on those merits. Um, if you're looking for ancillary benefits in, for instance, tourism, which is the area I work, no, there are no benefits in that area. But if um, what you're wanting to do is throw a party, then it's very difficult to judge, is it costing too much money? It's the wrong question to ask when you're in the, when you're in the middle of a party. And Tom Peck? Well, I think 9.3 billion is a reasonable bill for an Olympic Games. Of course, a lot of that money isn't as a direct loss to the taxpayer. A lot of it is invested in contracts to British companies anyway. If you're somebody who is looking forward to the Games, who loves sport, can't wait for the Games to start, then I think you would say yes. If you're somebody who is going to leave London for the duration of it because you can't stand it, you would say no. So it's very much a matter of personal taste. My own personal taste, yes, I think it's definitely worth it. So, John, now the Olympics budget has quadrupled uh, since 2005. How could this have happened? All Olympic budgets go up. That's the first thing to say. Um, you know, in my uh, 40 years of covering the Games, it's always, they've always either doubled or sometimes tripled. The reason that it has uh, in London is that uh, certain things were not taken account of when originally the budget was formulated. One of those, for instance, was the VAT, Value Added, added Tax, which is nearly a billion pounds. Of course, that's money that, as it were, the London Organising Committee of the Olympic Games and particularly the Olympic Delivery Authority, which actually built the, the venues, they are paying the government back for that billion pounds. That's the first thing. The second thing is, of course, um, there's including in that money is a lot of contingency money, which may not be spent at all. And we won't know that really until after the Games. And the third thing is, of course, that the day after we got the Games in Singapore, we had a terrorist attack in London, and that meant that the security budget immediately doubled and went up to seven, 700 million pounds, which is a lot more. So a combination of factors, uh, together with other things like the cost of steel doubling, um, which is very important, of course, for building Sam, has meant that the, the, uh, the cost of the venues has gone up considerably. The actual cost of putting on the games, which is £2 billion, which is entirely now paid for 
um, because of the money of income from ticket sales, from um, sponsorship, and also from various other rights, television rights being one of them. That's all covered or will be covered. Do you think it's been a particularly good time to host the Olympics? Yes, I think it is, um, because the problem with hosting the Olympics is that you've got to have an area, a big area, where you can stage most of the sporting events and also where you can have an Olympic village. And if we hadn't got the Games this time, that area in East London where the Games are going to be staged would have been used for other purposes. And we would then have been in a position of not being really able in London to be able to find a suitably large place with the best infrastructure that is needed for the Games in one place. And therefore, that's why I think it's a very appropriate time for London to stage the Games. Tom Peck, would you agree with that? Well, I think if when we won the bid in 2005, the world was remarkably different from that, which it turned into three years later, I don't think even the two economists who predicted the crash hadn't predicted it by then. And had we bid for it, had the opportunity to bid come around later, perhaps we wouldn't have done. But I do agree with what John says in that this was a unique opportunity to build in that area. And had we not taken it then, it may well have gone away. So, yes. Tom Jenkins? Um, I, I think the short answer um, to the question why have the numbers gone up so much is that the people putting the bid in got their numbers wrong. Yes, you're right. There have been unfortunate things that have caused price increases. Not to factor in VAT is a staggering mistake. It's not just sort of minor little peccadillo. It's a major error. And yes, security has to be factored in. But um, is this the right time? I don't know when is a good time to have the Olympic Games from a tourism point of view. I'm just looking at the point of view from uh, international, the international market to which London and UK sells itself. If you're having it, ideally don't have it in the middle of the main tourism season, I would say. Uh, maybe have it at another time of year. Well, uh, I mean, from the tourism point of view, um, what is absolutely crucial here is that people, uh, as he says, see that a great part is going along. They'll be watching it on television in China, in Russia, in uh, the United States, and they'll think, what an attractive city that is. Why don't we go there? Now, whether they do... Um, uh, is a different matter. I mean, London's such a huge tourist centre anyway. I, I think um, there's, several, there's several elements to the proposition that tourism is a beneficiary from this process. The, the first assertion is that by watching uh, sporting events on television, it naturally induces a sense that you want to go and visit the place where these sporting events take place. Um, and on the whole, when you look around the world at sporting events taking place, they're not associated with major impulses for tourism. St John's Wood has Lord's Cricket Ground, it becomes a suburban, affluent suburban area. You don't associate major sporting television programmes like Match of the Day with huge impulses of um, sporting tourism or uh, non-sporting tourism. When you look at the Olympic Games in a place like um, Sydney, Sydney had what was widely recognised as a good Games. Um, it showcased Sydney very well. It was praised as being one of the best Games ever. Um, but Sydney, in fact Australia, for the years after the Sydney Games, endured three years of declining tourism arrivals. During the same period, New Zealand saw increasing tourism arrivals. And astonishingly, New South Wales underperformed the rest of Australia. Now, you can, pro you, can, you can propose that there should be a tourism benefit, but the case of Australia is a classic example of there being no tourism benefit. I guess New Zealand may have con coincided with something else that was uh, happening well, at the time. Uh, well, uh, you, you're dead right. There, <laughs> there is an argument that Gollum beats the torpedo <laughs> when, it comes to, when it comes to tourism arrivals. Uh, there's one just thing we ought to mention on the question of tourism here and about you know, people seeing venues um, and whether they're going to be attracted. I, you know, I absolutely take the point, say, with swimming pools. You know, no one's going to be attracted to come to London because they see Rebecca Adlington or Michael Phelps swimming up and down the pool, a lovely pool there it is. What they will be more interested in is when you've got some of the other 
venues which will come across on television. The Equestrian Park, for instance, uh, in Greenwich, with an absolutely stunning backdrop of um, Canary Wharf um, and um, the P Palace at Greenwich. That's one example. Um, for instance, um, the Beach Volleyball in Whitehall being another example. People will be able to get a, a view of the whole of London by watching uh, some of the events on television, although I fully take his point about Sydney, which is, of course, a well-known statistic. I mean, were the Olympics to be held in Addis Ababa or, or somewhere else, I think there would be a tangible benefit for that host city. London is one of the most prestigious cities in the world, one of the most popular tourist destinations in the world. I don't see as holding, holding the Olympics here has a, a tangible benefit for the tourism industry. I find it a bit dispiriting the way the government is continually saying how this games will provide such a huge boost for London and actually London Eye reservations and theatre reservations and things are actually down during the course of the games. I don't think London's profile does, well it's not in need of a, of a significant raising and for the actual summer where they're here, as I understand it, it's a, it's a blow to tourism rather than a, a boost to tourism and it is hard to see quite what the games will do for London's tourism industry, which is already in fairly rude health. Now, just to remind you, you're listening to the voice of Russia in the heart of London. I'm Tim Walklate, and today I'm asking, are the London Olympics costing the taxpayer too much money? Okay, well, let's move on to legacy now. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to sort of move away from tourism, if we may. Um, and uh, John, you've covered. You said 11 Olympics. That's right. Now, many of the recent games, in fact, many of the games that haven't had particularly good track records, if you'll excuse the pun, uh, in terms of uh, stadia being used after the games, uh, into, which is called legacy. Um, so, for example, Athens. How would you advocate London's legacy? What, what, what does that look like in the future? Well, there are two areas of legacy. Um, the, the first one is concrete legacy, literally, you know, venues. And the second is what is termed the soft legacy. In other words, people wanting to do sport um, or more people wanting to do sport because they're encouraged by the games. Now, if you start off with the concrete legacy, there are several venues that have gone up. Let's take the swimming pool, for instance, example. Now, Paris has got 21 Olympic 50 meter pools uh, indoors. Uh, London has got three before we start off with the, um, the Olympic Aquatic Center. We were gonna have in East London, in any case, an Olympic swimming pool at Sunstone in order to redress the balance. So that will be one area where we can, we can benefit. There will also be you know, things like the Olympic Village, which can be used for housing. The infrastructure facilities, the transport facilities there are extremely good. I mean, hopefully during the Games, but certainly after the Games, because there are so many different lines going through that area. So uh, there's also the main stadium. Still very controversial what's going to happen. Hopefully will be used as a mixture of uh, athletics and football and other things, but that's a, a long, long story. And then there are the other things like the cycling track. Cycling immensely popular now in, in Britain. Cycling track will also help it. So that's the concrete thing. If we look at the soft legacy, what we hope, what we hope is that more youngsters in particular will be wanting to go out and cycle, play football, run, swim, do judo, whatever it is. Um, and the efforts are being made to ensure that this takes place. Whether it does take place, of course, we won't know until our, well after the Games, you know, several years after the Games. But looking at, uh, at previous Games, a lot haven't had particularly good track records. I mean, look at Montreal, for example. Uh, well, yes, I mean, uh, if you took Montreal, uh, Montreal was a disaster because um, they did not plan the after effect of the games before they started, apart from the fact that, you know, it made a great loss, despite the mayor, Jean Drapeau, saying it was no more likely for Montreal to have a uh, make a loss on the games than for a man to have a baby which was one of the most notorious quotes that uh, has ever been issued by an uh, organizing uh, organizer of the games montreal was a disaster in certain ways and you know athens too but um the problem with countries like uh, or a city like athens is 
It's a very small city when you compare it to London. The demand for facilities of that nature are far less than they are in London. And some of the facilities in Athens, like the housing, the, the Olympic Village, where a lot of us stayed, you know, are, you know, are being used now. It's the sports facilities that are not being used. And just a quick line on, on you covered the Moscow Games as yeah. well. What, what was the legacy left by that? I think the legacy for Moscow was a different one entirely. And the reason for that is was because I think it was an opportunity for the Soviet Union, as then was, to showcase that it could stage a wonderful Olympics that was its legacy it was to put moscow on the map they had a lot of the facilities anyway so in that sense a far more of important for them to show the world what the soviet union could do tom well yes there's certainly <laughs> two parts of the legacy the first part the sporting part the idea that this olympics would suddenly mean uh, the target of a million people would start participating in sport that, I think, was a bit of a red herring. I don't know why anyone would think that watching the Olympics would make everyone play badminton for 10 years. They, they might enjoy watching it for a little while. In terms of the, the concrete legacy, the buildings, I know that six out of the eight venues are secured, the ones on the Olympic site. There's a project to build 8,000 homes on the site, which lasts for 20 years. And it does seem that we are in better shape than any games that I'm aware of. But at the centre of it all is the stadium, and that is very much undecided. And if that isn't the very central potentially big white elephant in the middle which threatens all the rest of it and the security and the legacy of that we will see what happens in the next couple of months and tom tom jenkins uh, what's what are your thoughts on the legacy of the london games well i mean uh, from a tourism point of view i um it's interesting because as, as um, the others have pointed out london is a major tourism city i think um during the games themselves we're going to see a major shortfall in normal tourism arrivals. That's to be expected and anticipated. Uh, regular tourists tend to stay away from mega events. I think what will be interesting is next year to see what happens. But what would usually happen is it takes a bit of time to rebuild momentum. When you throw away a large chunk of demand, and that's what effectively we've done this summer, it takes time for people to start to get back into the mode of coming here. Tom? Well, one very interesting point that I wanted to ask you about mm -hmm. is, um, Tom, is um, the projections for the for future of the site are based on a million visitors a year to the big ArcelorMittal orbit, a certain 500,000 visitors, I think, to this spe specific uh, London Olympic Museum that they're building there um, to recognise the fact that it's the first city to host it three times. But what concerns me is that, yes, I would think that if the Games build up this enthusiasm, sense of fun, sense of joy about the Olympics, come the end of the Paralympics, that site is shut, the doors are locked, and it's not open for another year. And then in a year's time, that's when they're hoping these million visitors a year will start coming to the orbit. Is that I, likely? <clears throat> is that sustainable? I think the answer is it's implausible. I, I would never say it won't happen. I mean, uh, so you can open anything up, and unexpectedly it proves to be exciting. I don't think, for example, and uh, we, we should really take, well, I take my hat off to the organisers of the Olympic Games, that they've managed to sell tickets to the Olympic Games like no other organiser has done. So we've witnessed a fantastic surge of domestic interest in the Games. And this is, this is quite remarkable. It's possible that this will convert itself into domestic interest in coming to see where the Olympic Games took place. Will it really generate lots of tourism? I think it's very unlikely. If you look at places like um, Wimbledon Lawn Tennis Museum, a world sporting venue of consuming interest to British people, it attracts about 50 to 60,000 people a year. That's the pitch you need to think of. A million, not saying it won't happen, just saying, is it real? It's a big tall tower with a viewing platform. <laughs> what about on a national level? Mm. Uh, the lasting leg legacy of the Olympics on a national level, will, will it have much impact? I think less, obviously, outside London, uh, apart from the area we've already discussed, which is hopefully that people will be you know, encouraged to take up, uh, particularly youngsters, to take up sport. Certain areas of the country uh, do, f do resent the fact that uh, they perceive it as the London Games, and it is the London Games. It was, <laughs> London that won it was London that won the Games. It's cities that win the Games, not necessarily the countries. But they, you know, there have been efforts made um, partly by necessity, for instance, having the rowing at Weymouth and, you know, it's a town I know very well. You know, th 
there's, there is great interest in Weymouth and the fact that the sailing is going to be there and, you know, it is a, an attractive venue. And you've got various other areas too, like um, the football being spread spread around. But certainly the rest of the country is not going to have the benefit, if there is benefit, that London has had. This is the voice of Russia in London. John, you brushed upon briefly about security, about the the bombings the following day. Uh, I think the London riots have to be mentioned too. Uh, Now, security costs have have soared. Um, Mm. They're recruiting, I I believe, 23,000 security guards. Um, Initially, Mm. it was going to be 11,000. Correct. A lot of those are unpaid. Do do you think this is possibly an overreaction to to what's happened in the past few years? I think it's a necessary reaction is the answer because... uh, you know, there was no doubt about it. It was it was fascinating being in Singapore um, on the f- on the day, and Les Keep, the French newspaper, of course, Paris was London's great opposition, had as their headline the next day after we got the games. Pourquoi Londres? Why London? Then the day afterwards, when the bombing, it was tous derrière Londres, everyone behind London, because um, people realised that uh, London had got the games and everyone now had to ensure that we were a bit as safe as possible. I think they're taking the attitude, there must not be any criticism. You know, people can set off bombs, but we're going to do our best to try to stop them. And, uh, you know, many people feel that it's uh, that Olympic Games is the safest place simply because um, there are so many security guards there is so much policing there's so many people being watched if you want to get an, a, um, a lot of publicity out of s- bombing a, a city the best time is to do it at another time when people aren't watching are the security costs too high that's a very difficult question to answer but what the pub the government report said last week was that if they are why have they quadrupled and why have they why have they doubled since in december when, as is rightly pointed out, the day after the Games were won was a vast terrorist attack on London. Why security is not at the top of people's minds from that point onwards? It seems so strange that it can double so late in the day. I guess because I, the London riots had rubbed salt into already quite deep wounds. No? Um, I don't know if the London, if the riots were a significant factor in the increasing of the security budget. Okay, I mean, the London riots were to do with um, looting. <laughs> There's not a lot to loot. Um, in, in the Olympic Park itself, uh, and Westfield uh, has fairly impressive security around it. And the odd thing about the riots, if I may just interject a, a p- small point, is the amazing reaction in the origin markets towards the London riots, where there was almost no impact in terms of confidence or interest in London as a destination. And I think we forget the extent to which people who are about to come to this country factor in a degree of normalcy behind these events. And so it it didn't strike anyone as unusual. What was interesting, just to capture your point about sport, the crucial point about them is that they didn't occur anywhere near any sites. So this was something that almost seemed to take place in the Bonnier, so to speak. Finally, I'd actually like to ask uh, you all your final thoughts, but also pose you this question. Is there a danger that the London Olympics will be seen as the austerity Olympics? No, I don't think so. I mean, Beijing was an extraordinary event, um, but it was soulless, very well organised, you know, huge numbers of people, you know, able to help you, you know, went through a door, there were four people sort of opening the door for you. Um, I certainly don't think it will be seen as the austerity Olympics. I think uh, much will depend on the success of the Games in the international perception by how many heroes there are, how many really good events there are, that sort of thing. But certainly not, uh, I would think, the austerity Games. I don't think people will see that. Tom Jenkins, I austerity don't, games? I don't think this is going to be an austerity games at all, not at £9.8 um, billion. Pounds. This will be um, a very extravagant games. It should be a wonderful party. Uh, don't confuse this with tourism. Tom Peck? I think you'll see full stadiums and very enthusiastic supporters, and I think that will be the totem of the games, and I don't think austerity will come into it in people's perceptions. OK, well, we have to finish there, I'm afraid. But uh, you've been listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Tim Walklate, and joining me in this discussion was Tom Peck, the Olympics correspondent at The Independent Newspaper. 
Tom Jenkins, who is Executive Director of the European Tour Operators Association, and John Goodbody, who is the Sunday Times Olympics correspondent. Stay with us, we'll be back shortly. Ooh.